The recent conference we held in Birmingham, putting AI to work in the NHS, had two main purposes. The first was to look into ways that AI could be used in the NHS, drawing from projects in healthcare, academia and the commercial world, to show what these new tools might offer. The second purpose was to launch a new and innovative partnership between Midlands and Lancashire CSU and our partner PredictX to channel some of this new creative thinking. There are many different areas where AI shows promise, such as diagnostic imaging, reporting x-rays and detecting abnormalities more effectively than the human eye. Speech processing and language recognition is now entering the domestic market and gives us a whole new interface with our machines. But there are many opportunities too for AI in the broad field of data analysis and prediction, and this is where our partnership with PredictX operates. At the conference, PredictX Chief Executive Kisup Cho started off his keynote with a useful catch-up explanation of what AI is and what terms like machine learning and deep learning really mean. Okay, so we're going to go through the demystification process now. So, how many of you can actually stand up and describe what AI is and what machine learning is and what the difference is? But you've heard these terms bandied about interchangeably all the time, yes? Okay, let's assume you're on some sort of social media site and only thing you can choose is your relationship status and how much you like cats. And then from that, social media or the advertisers are going to try to understand you. So the way they would do that is if, if you're waiting for a miracle and, and you really like cats and those people with those profiles tend to buy green socks, then that's a data point to train a model. At a very basic level, the first starting point of AI is we have a weight, say 0.57, of your status with, and plus 0.78. Those are the two weights that, that our model is going to place on your relationship status and the cat score. And with that, some sort of function is going to predict whether you like green socks and green apples and things like that, OK? These are called linear models. And humans are very much involved with this, right? Because you're, you're selecting models, you're, you're running the regressions, you're figuring out the weights and calibrating. Machine learning is we are still going to use the relationship status and the CAT score, but the machine is actually going to then compute the weights. And as the data changes, the weights are changing, but, and you don't need to be intervening to do that. So this is a very simplistic example, but this will give you a clue. OK, the last bit, deep learning, is we don't even know what the features are. It may or may not use the relationship status. It may, not, may or may not use whether you like cats or not. It may use other things, like how many times you click outside, how quickly you navigate away, or anything else. And the deep learning says, ah, we will just keep running these routines and figure out which features are the most impactful, predictive, and what weights it's going to choose. Where all this leads is best understood with a concrete example. And Kesup's colleague at PredictX, Matthew Barrington, reported on a pilot study they've been doing with Essex County Council. It correlated a number of social factors affecting a household with the risk that a young child from that household would not be developmentally ready enough to start going to school. So we've got kind of two main questions. Can we predict which children will not be school ready on starting school in reception? And can we improve that number prior to those children, those individuals starting school? These are the data sources that we looked at. So we've got things like deprivation, income, health, employment and education. And then others that were around the local area, around people, the types of people that live within those areas. So we had some information on drugs and drug abuse, domestic abuse, youth offences and crime all coming from the police. And what we needed to do was make sense of this information so we could then use it for modelling. So I've gone back to a slide Kesup used earlier um, and that the Essex School Readiness model fits kind of in the more machine learning area. reason we didn't use a deep learning model, like as Kesup alluded to earlier, um, was that, yes, we might get an accurate score. So for each household we could say, 
um, this individual starting school will be school ready, well, yes or no, and it would be accurate, but we don't know why. We don't know, is it because of their deprivation? Is it because they've got drugs and alcohol issues in their area? Is it because of the crime rate? We, we, we just don't know. We don't know the features that the model is then using. We found that one, people that are known to services are 1.5 times more likely to not be ready for schools. And we're going to say the model was 75% accurate when enabling resources to be targeted on those correct communities. Lydia Drumwright is from Cambridge University and is the Director of Cambridge Clinical Informatics. She has huge experience working with data from electronic patient records that gives us a number of pointers to where the real benefits of using AI technology for the health service may lie. So I love pictures like this because I think this is kind of the Hollywood, and, and I grew up quite close to Hollywood, image of artificial intelligence and healthcare. Doctors are going to be um, standing there in the room and, and looking at people's genetic material and what have you. And, and, and that's not really, really the reality. And I think that's brought on this concept of, is this really um, real or is this just a bunch of hype? Um, and I think a lot of people get frustrated that way. I do too. I think that, um, thank you, Kisip, for for that wonderful introduction um, to people for artificial intelligence because really um, in, in my world I see it as just mathematics and, and we've used mathematic, mathematical tools for a very long time. So we do a lot of work in decision support but remember as I talk about this, this is one group, okay? So is a standard um, machine learning uh, kind of system, we have a test data set that predicts known SSI in our data set, that's surgical site infection, and then we can um, send that into real-time predictions. So as the patient is being worked on in surgery, by the time they close, we have a prediction whether or not they have high or low risk for surgical site infection. That's all it's doing. It's binning the patients into two categories. And um, then you can modify the care plan. Now, the good news about this, this is we're doing this in partnership with our um, colleagues out of University of Iowa um, hospitals and clinics. And um, you can see this headline where they were reducing surgical site infection by 74%. They're up to 85% right now. So in the US, surgical site infection is estimated to cost 10 billion. They're reducing it by 85%. Um, in their colorectal surgery in their hospital. So that was just the introduction to say, okay, so why aren't we doing this? Why isn't this magic happening at the level that internet banking, um, I think why this isn't happening, and in particular here, is there's issues around appropriate legal, ethical, and acceptable use of routine data. Those are rooted, everyone is scared about the GDPR. I've got really good news for you. So I also chair the Cambridge Central Ethics Committee. And in my opinion, GDPR is good for everyone. It's not going to make things harder for us. It's going to make our relationship with the people whose data we're looking at a lot better. OK? So what are we doing? Um, with the patients and the public, uh, I just want to quickly say we do a ton of engagement and involvement. We're asking them to tell us how to manage their data appropriately, and this is what they tell us. They have expectations of research for patient benefit. They think we're doing that. If we're not doing that, we're letting them down. Um, they think researchers and healthcare professionals are trustworthy. They are really big sticklers on anonymization data protection and transparency. They want all those things happening. Um, I'm really sorry to say for industry, they do talk about industrial partners as questionable. Um, and we work with them on quite a regular basis to understand where that's coming from so we can make that relationship work because industry is so important to us. The exciting project that we're starting, this wasn't enough because I knew that if you were a company, you wouldn't come to me if you just wanted to develop a product but had no, no real idea. It was at the beginning of what you wanted to do. So I kept thinking, I really need to deliver synthetic data, data that looks like the patient data, data that looks like my whole data set of clinical data, but isn't really, because that's 
legal, it's ethical, it's appropriate, and they need access to it to develop their tools to a state where now it seems appropriate to come in and try it out on real patient data. We're going to want to partner with commercial concerns because there's a lot of innovation and insight being gained there and they have the economic models to drive this forward that may not be there in the NHS. At the conference we invited Matteo Bellucci, Chief Executive of Your.md, to tell us about his work developing an internet service that people can turn to for help with minor ailments. He calls it pre-primary care and sees it as a way of addressing the problem people find in accessing GPs and other primary care help. UMD has realized that there is a shortage of primary care physicians in the world. It's impossible to fill it by training more physicians. Population is growing older, more people. So we believe that AI can come to the rescue. I'll just walk you through this quick example. So you have Maria here. She's waking up at night. She's uh, unwell. She doesn't know what to do. She goes to Google and she's got some headaches, she's got some flashing lights, and then she finds a page on the Mayo Clinic that, that describes brain tumor, she recognizes the same symptom, she freaks out, she's really worried. So what if, what if you could help those people with minor ailments and give them safe, actionable, trustworthy information, you can just go through this AI, the AI understands your individual probability, it gives you safe recommendation, we have a partnership, we have NHS, ch NHS choices for the information, and then it can point you to your options. Say, so you need to see a GP, click here to find your closest GP. You can just go and buy some hay fever treatment, just go and get it online or go to Boots. Um, and we obviously triage everybody. So the, co the commercial model is very similar to uh, kind of the standard online platforms because we believe that if we can help people understand what's wrong with them, it's a little bit like Google. If we know you've got migraine, we can put you in touch with companies that have products or services that can help you with migraine. We have charities which we don't charge. We work with the NHS which we don't charge, but for private establishments that want to sell specialist services or drugs or, or, or solutions, we just basically put them in touch with the users. AI can be used to give people information and it can also support people who want to improve their health through a change in behaviour. Smoking is still a major cause of ill health in the UK and increasing smoking cessation would really benefit the NHS. David Crane, Chief Executive of Smoke Free, described how he used AI to develop a smartphone app that people could use. So what we do in Smoke Free is we're focusing AI on a particular treatment area and that is cravings. Uh, Almost all smokers who've recently quit were experienced a craving, and, and whilst all cravings don't lead to cigarettes, all cigarettes are almost always preceded by a craving. So what we try to do is to help people find tips that work for them. And we start with the screen on the left, we ask people, if people say that they're craving, we then ask them to tell us what they're craving about, and we use natural language processing at this point. What we then do is um, we offer a tip for, in this case, dealing with uh, having uh, a craving around a morning coffee. If users like this particular tip, great, but if they're not, if this tip isn't something that they think will work for them, we cycle through this process until we find a tip that, work, that the user thinks will work for them. Now this gives us three bits of important uh, information. Firstly, it gives us evidence about which tips work in general, and there really isn't much scientific evidence uh, about this yet. Secondly, because we categorise the tips, uh, what we can do is get better at recommending tips for other cravings that this particular individual might suffer from. Tips that might involve activities or distractions, for example. And thirdly, because we're grouping the individual, um, we're, we're categorising them, the next time uh, a new user comes along that sort of meets their profile, the tips that we suggest to them could be right first time, more of the time. We actually had two behavioural scientists on our panel at the conference, David Crane and Steve Martin. Steve is a best-selling author and chief executive of Influence at Work. When it comes to changing people's behaviour to improve healthcare, there are well-established ways this can be done. I work in persuasion science, influence science. Uh, primarily we work in what we call social influence theory. This is the idea that a small handful of fundamental human characteristics influence behavior, okay? This is Gordon Sinclair. He ran a restaurant. And the problem was people who would phone up 
and book a table for dinner and then just not show up. He was able to instruct his receptionist when they took bookings to just change a couple of words in the interaction and it led to a significant drop in the number of people that wouldn't show up to his restaurant. Here's how it worked. After confirming the reservation, they'd simply then say, by the way, if you have to change your plans, would you be willing to call us back and let us know in advance? Any idea, actually, how much the, the no-show phenomena costs the NHS? The most recent estimate I heard of was somewhere in the order of about £800 million a year. So here's what we did. We got our receptionists in these GP surgeries to do exactly the same thing. Someone phones up for an appointment. We ask them, your appointment's next Tuesday at 2.30, so is that convenient for you? Yeah. Could you just confirm the day and time of that appointment again for me? Uh, next Tuesday. <laughs> at 2.30, yeah. Yeah. Takes an extra second, doesn't cost any money. What impact does that actually have on the subsequent no-show rate in that group that are asked to repeat back the time and day of the appointment? Turns out it has a small effect. But remember, these are lots and lots of transactions. So that small effect is actually significant. It's about 3.5%. But 3.5% of an £800 million problem is... 25 million quid. If someone came to you and said, I have a costless intervention that will save you 25 million quid a year. I can give it to you in 10 seconds over the phone. You'll take the call, right? We've become pretty accomplished at recognizing what we should say, how we structure a message that is most likely to capture attention and cause people to at least initially act or consider it. But it strikes me that one of the things that we've been talking about this morning is how good new technology, data science, AI is becoming at recognizing and pinpointing who should be the recipient. Why don't we just do that? After a panel discussion and a chance for our NHS delegates to consider how AI could operate in their field, the final task was to launch the new innovation partnership between Midlands and Lancashire CSU and the data analytics firm PredictX. Kiesop and I explained that our objective was to look for real world problems to which AI could be a solution, as opposed to developing blue sky applications and then hunting for a problem for them to solve. I think the health sector is already um, thinking of this now, it's uh, becoming more attuned to prevention. Um, and um, one of the things that it needs to embrace is a bit more of a risk-taking culture, the ability to try something uh, at a small scale, have it succeed or fail without any real repercussions, and learn from that. In this new partnership, the CSU can bring a knowledge of the health and care territory, we can find people we can do experimental work with out in the field, and we bring extensive analytical and data management capability. PredictX brings their understanding of new technology and real-world experience of using data analysis across sectors. They are experienced too in working with academic partners and in time we would hope to bring more members into the team. We want to be realistic about this venture. The achievement of marginal gains, we think, is a better prospect than grand transformational plans. But especially in healthcare, that's, that's the case because um, there is no appetite really for very, very long-term uh, projects and because the technologies have come up so fast and at such an advanced state at the point today, we can do things much faster, much quicker and, and adapt what's called an agile methodology. So, we're at an initial ideas trawling phase and we intend to ramp up over time. We will be very interested to hear from potential partners in the NHS and local government who think there may be an opportunity for our partnership to help them provide better health and care through the application of AI. We're ready to start work.